Hello, everyone. Good morning and good evening. I'm April from USC. Welcome back to our Zoom and live stream after Spring Festival. I feel so glad to tell you today's event is the 86th event of USC event series. It is another masterclass from Russia School of Education. The topic is about an introduction, scenario-based assessments. And today's guest speakers, we also have our old friend of masterclass, Dr. Rob Fieldback, the professor of clinical education and chair of MAT TESO program from University of Southern California. Welcome, Dr. Fieldback. Great. And welcome. And we also have Dr. Anthony John Kunan, the senior research fellow at Carnegie Mellon University and also the principal um, assessment scientist of Duolingo English Test. Welcome, Dr. Kunan. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thank you. And we have Q&A part in the last 15 minutes after mm -hmm. presentation. Please feel free to put your questions in the Zoom chat box and also to our live streaming platform audience. You're also welcome to comment and we will help you to bring some questions into the Q&A part. And kindly remind you yourself during presentation for a good event quality. The webinar will be recorded and might be used as video material in future. Okay, without further ado, let's start our masterclass. Welcome our speakers. Great, thank you, April. Uh, so I'm gonna start us off. Welcome everyone, uh, not only to those of you that are logged in here to Zoom, but to all of those that are you uh, viewing via the live stream. We uh, so are so pleased that you're here and taking time to join us tonight. Uh, as April said, uh, I'm Rob Philback, uh, professor of education at USC, and it's such a pleasure to be chair of our MAT TESOL program. And it's been a real uh, pleasure for our program to host uh, some of these master classes. And uh, if you've joined them in the past, you know that we try to bring you topics that are relevant and practical and will help you, whether you're a pre-service teacher or an experienced teacher. And tonight, I know that uh, you won't be disappointed. Uh, that's really what I think we've done in bringing <clears throat> Anthony Kuhn into you this evening. Um, I wanna just briefly introduce Anthony and then I'll turn it over, uh, turn it over to him shortly. Uh, as April said, uh, Dr. Kunin has his roles at Duolingo and as a senior research fellow at Carnegie Mellon University. But in addition to this, he has a really vast experience as a university professor. Uh, he's taught at a number of esteemed universities, ranging from the University of Hong Kong uh, and Nanyang Technology University in Singapore to right here in LA, California State University uh, of Los Angeles. We also were lucky enough to have him teach some courses for us in our own USC TESOL program. But in addition to this, he's given talks or workshops in 40 different countries around the world. So uh, Anthony brings a deep experience base to the things he's going to present to you tonight. Uh, he also served as the president of the International Language Testing Association here in the U.S., and he was the founding president of the Asian Association for Language Assessment. He's published close to 100 academic articles or books on assessment topics, and his most recent journal article, Developing a Scenario-Based Language Testing in an Asian University, is, of course, very relevant to the topic of his presentation today. So I'm really eager to engage with uh, Anthony. Uh, I hope you'll listen carefully and prepare some questions to ask. Uh, the longer I've been in this field, the more appreciation I have for the role of assessment in the teaching endeavor. Uh, and it's increasingly important all around the world. I know our students talk about uh, dealing with strong exam-based uh, contexts, and for lots of reasons, we want to figure out how to increase investment and motivation and meaningful learning through assessment. And I know Dr. Kunin is going to help us do that tonight. So again, uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Kunin. And I know you're going to find his talk useful. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Kunin. OK, good morning um, from uh, California. That's where I am, and that's where US is, you know. 
Uh, I'm going to get started by uh, sharing my screen. I want to thank um, um, USC, Rob, and others for encouraging me to talk about this topic that I've been talking about for the last six months or a year at different venues. Um, I even have a published paper with colleagues from uh, uh, the University of Macau and uh, the University of uh, uh, Ottawa. So you'll see that in my presentation. So thank you for being us. I'm very happy to uh, be part of this um, talk and, uh, and conversation that uh, accompanies this talk later on. So as the title says, <clears throat> this is an intro, uh, an introduction to scenario-based language assessment. And uh, I will go through some of the major themes and major features of uh, scenario-based language assessment. I'll give you one uh, big example uh, with uh, lots of bells and whistles. And I will also suggest a few um, types of scenarios used by other testing, uh, by testing organizations, actually. So without uh, much uh, delay, let me get started. I hope, can you see my screen? April? Yes, it's good. Okay, all right. Okay, now before we get started on any test development or test design, uh, we have to make sure of one thing, and that is we need to have a framework for designing a test or for uh, developing a test. So if your employer or your principal of a school or a college or a university comes to you and says, we want you to design a test, get your team together and design a test. Well, you know, uh, that's a reasonable uh, expectation from many of you who are going to specialize in applied linguistics or TESOL. So the question is, what should you do? Well, there are a number of things that should come to your mind immediately that you'd need to have a language assessment design framework because that's going to you know, help you uh, plan and design and replicate uh, your tests as you go along. You need some evidence-centered design, and that is for validation purposes, to know if your test is appropriate. Is, is this test that I've developed valid? And is it fair? Is it, uh, you know, unbiased? Things like that. You need to also have a psychometric framework, and that is how you're going to score the tests. Is it going to be uh, zero, one, like yes, no, or correct, incorrect? Or is it going to be on a scale of zero to five or zero to 10 points? Now, some parts of the test may be zero one type and some other parts may be zero to 10, other parts may be zero to 25. So you've got to take some psychometric considerations um, into play. And finally, if you're de designing a test that's uh, uh, where test takers have to be, you know, uh, honest with their, uh, test taking, then you need to have some kind of test security, especially these days where people talk about online testing, um, testing from home, things like that. You've got to have security to make sure that test takers take the test uh, in the desirable way that you want uh, it to be done. So <clears throat> here we go. Here is the assessment design framework. So a number of things you've got to ask yourself. Okay, what's the purpose of my assessment that you're going to design? Is it going to be a placement test? That is, students are going to be placed in different classes, like ESL classes, like a listening and speaking class, or a reading and writing class, or is it a um, dissertation uh, help, or is it a, a oral presentation? So those are different kinds of placements. So you've got to decide, okay, my test is going to be a placement test. Or is your test going to be an admission test? Admission to a particular type of school, admission to a college or a university, admission to a particular type of program, um, admission to the workplace. Uh, we'll, I'll give you an example later on about uh, health professionals working in a drug store, a pharmaceutical store, or working as a medical assistant in a hospital or in a clinic. Um, or if you're going to be an air traffic controller in um, in the aviation industry. So those are admissions or selection types of tests. And then there's diagnostic, where you design a test, you administer the test, 
and uh, test takers are given feedback as to what their strengths and weaknesses are. And that's the only purpose of that type of test. So it's not, it's got nothing to do with placement or admission. It may be purely diagnostic and there may be useful uh, context. I mean, there are contexts in which that kind of thing may be useful. Now, you've also got to um, answer some of these other questions that you may have. What's the context of the test so that uh, you can figure out more things? Uh, what's the age of the test taker? Is it, are they in college? Are they undergraduates or postgraduates? Are they in a workplace? Do you need to know that? And what kind of constructs do you want to cover? Constructs are abstract representations of skill areas, if you like, like speaking, writing, reading, listening. So do you want to cover all of them? Do you want to cover just two of them? Uh, what kinds of tasks do you need? Do you need many tasks for each of them or just one task or two tasks? So you've got to, you know, answer questions related to that. And then you've got to answer questions related to external proficiency levels. Um, now, the most popular one uh, around the world is the Common European Framework of Reference. They have six levels. The, there's the China Standards of English that has 10 levels. Uh, there are many other organizations. Uh, the ACTFEL, the American Council for Teaching of Foreign Languages, they have their own uh, standards. So if you want to align your test to a particular national or international standard, which one would you choose and how would you do that? So that's another uh, question you've got to answer. Also, task types. What's the, what types of tasks are you going to have in your test? Are they going to be what we typically call discrete point tests? That is, you test one language item at a time, like you focus on subject-verb agreement in grammar, or you focus on some morphological ending for vocabulary, or some uh, discourse markers, you know, connectors, things like that. Or are you going to focus more on integrative language skills, multi-skills like listening, reading, and writing, or reading, writing, and speaking? So you can have combinations of these because maybe that's what you're interested in. You're interested in finding out if your test takers, your students, um, have a reasonable way of doing two, two skills at the same time, two skills one after the other. So like listening and speaking or reading and writing. You may not be interested in you know, just one skill, just listening by itself or speaking by itself, which is somewhat artificial anyway. Finally, under this type of question, you've got to answer the question regarding speed. What type of speed are, are you expecting the test taker to do these tasks? Are they at a very normal pace? Uh, or are they at, in a speeded way? I mean, you know, which requires some kind of automaticity in uh, recording your answers or writing your essay. Uh, another consideration is authenticity. Many people think that this is a very important aspect of an assessment because they want to have tasks in an assessment that are similar to tasks in the real world. So if you are testing test takers, um, who are going to college, you want to see that your tasks represent tasks that test takers might engage in in the first semester or the second semester or the first year of uh, college. So authenticity is very important and uh, it's increasingly becoming more important But people say, why should we have tasks that don't look like tasks that our test takers would encounter later on? And then comes the innovation part. And there are many types of innovation these days. One is a scenario based, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Another is computer delivery, where a computer delivers a test. I mean, the test is written uh, as a paper and pencil test, and then a computer delivers it. There's another type which is called computer adaptive, where the test is uh, adapting itself to, your, to a test taker's level of proficiency. So if the test taker is a highly proficient test taker, the test would get more and more difficult until um, the uh, test's algorithm uh, rule system uh, is able to estimate their level of uh, proficiency. If the test taker is getting many items wrong, the test would come down in difficulty. And that way the test is in a way kind of tailored to the test taker. 
So in a traditional test, as you know, if you go into a, a testing center, you're given two hours of time and you have to answer, say, all the 100 questions. In a computer adaptive test, you don't have to do that. You may get fewer questions, but it'll, the questions will be tailored to you, tailored to your proficiency, tailored to the test taker's proficiency. And finally, in whatever we do, we've got to ask questions about what are the consequences of assessment? Are they beneficial? Beneficial to the test taker, beneficial to the institution, beneficial to, to society in general. So if, it, if an assessment is not going to be beneficial, you've got to ask yourself, what's the point of the assessment? Why should you create one? So it has to be beneficial. It has to have positive washback. That is the, in the context of uh, university or college education, you want to see the test taker engage in certain activities before the taking the test. And that would be like preparation. And if the test is authentic, if the test uh, is meaningful, they will uh, you know, do similar tasks prior to taking the test. So the opportunity to learn will be positive. Now, if a test does uh, kind of things that are not relevant to uh, their daily work, but, it's, but they have it anyway, uh, test takers will, you know, do what they have to do to get a high score. So, and that's not a desirable uh, outcome. So, we would like tests to be uh, meaningful. <clears throat> Okay, so what's the purpose of a scenario-based assessment? Scenario-based assessment gives students problem-solving tasks. They, they don't focus on the grammar, the vocabulary, the discourse, or the reading or the writing. They don't say, read this paragraph and answer some questions, or write this essay, or you know things like that. They're given tasks to accomplish, and that's the whole idea of a scenario. A scenario helps students solve some tasks. It, it, they are presented with relevant and reasonably realistic problems. You could, they could simulate a social context for problem solving. Uh, it typically uses independent skills as well as integrative skills. For independent, I mean, say, listening all by itself or writing all by itself, but it could also be integrated. So you have listening and speaking or reading and writing, or listening and writing, that sort of thing. Typically these days, uh, there's no getting around to using technology. So we use technology in scenario-based assessments. You can use audio, video, and uh, visuals that are meaningful to the, the scenario. And it should typically model good learning practice. This is something that's very critical in scenario-based assessment. Okay. Uh, Purpura, uh, James Purpura, who's written uh, extensively on uh, scenario-based assessment, outlines uh, many dimensions of an assessment. They talk about how the contextual dimension is very important, real-world competencies. You, the scenarios should present tasks that, that require test takers to deal with real-world competence. In, in, a, in an example he gives, he says, he and his friend want to decide on where to go on a holiday. So one of them says, let's go to Jordan. It's got beautiful historic uh, locations. We can spend time there. But, it, but he says, no, but I want to go to Barcelona. I want to go to the beach. I want to just relax. So this is a real world competency. And in his task, that's a scenario in his task, in his test. And so he, one of, both of them have to convince each other of uh, the pros and cons of their city. And then they have to decide, okay, I'll go to Jordan or I'll go to Barcelona. So these are, that's a real world uh, issue. Uh, you and your family members may experience that or you and your uh, friends may experience that. They may say, let's go for a holiday, but they have different ideas and you have to, uh, you know, convince the other party that uh, your, your, location is better, your city or your town or your area is a better location for a holiday. Uh, organizational context, the, the scenario has to be organized in a particular way um, so that it's meaningful. It has to have a socio-cultural context as well. Uh, that is, it's situated in, a, in society. It requires certain cultural aspects and certain socio 
pragmatic kinds of uh, uh, features are in a, in a task of this kind. Um, it should have a socio-cognitive dimension. That is, your mind is engaged in some cognitive processes and activities that are appropriate for uh, language learning and language uh, uh, production. It could have an instructional dimension, and this is assessment as instruction. So when the test takers uh, do some parts of the text, uh, some parts of the test, they could be given feedback. Yes, you are right. Or yes, um, sorry, you, you didn't go the right way. You should try again. So this gives test takers an opportunity to correct themselves. So, you know, the, the idea of uh, immediate diagnostic feedback is an aspect of uh, the instructional dimension. It has an affective dimension. So, for example, you are expected to convince someone so about going to uh, going back to the example uh, of uh, going to a particular city or a country and um, there's a there's a kind of affective dimension to it where you have to use your um, affective vocabulary to convince not only facts and figures but you've got to say you know you like it it's a very enjoyable place so affect is a very important aspect and interaction is certainly very important. If you are actually doing a kind of oh, on the phone or on the on Zoom or some, some kind of device where you have to um, convince the other party, well, you're engaging in an interactional practice where there is conversation and there are different turns. And uh, the, at the end of many turns, uh, one of them agrees to uh, a particular location that the other party had agreed. Elicitation is another aspect. You elicit um, uh, speaking while you are engaged in the task. And then, of course, there's the proficiency dimension uh, in terms of the content as well as proficiency levels. You can have uh, scenarios from, you know, if you like, using the CFR from level one to level six, so A1 to um, C2. So you can uh, choose the proficiency level you would like the scenario to be based at. So where can SBA be used? Well, it can be used in low stakes assessments. It can also be used in high stakes, but I'll come to that in a little bit. Could be used in low stakes assessments. Could be used in classroom settings, in language learning centers, in small classes, in pairs, in small groups. Could be collaborative. It could be student directed, students could do this themselves if you give them the scenario and they could get going in pairs or in groups. And it could also be used as a way of checking on how students are progressing in their language learning. So it could be used in a formative sort of way. Now, what are the examples? Here are some examples that have worked in our context. Um, Getting to know series is a series that is appropriate for a student who's going to travel to another city or another country for study. Many of you uh, have traveled to study. So one of the first things you've got to do is getting your visa. I know it's a headache uh, around the world, but you have to get a visa to go. They don't let you just get on a plane without a visa, right? So how does getting your visa work? So test takers typically have to, these days, go on a website, they've got to read information, they've got to download the form, fill out the form, <clears throat> write maybe a paragraph to persuade um, the visa officer why you need to get a visa, etc. So, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> getting your visa is a very good scenario that you could use. Getting to know your program, getting to know your university, getting to know your professors, getting to know your classmates, getting to know the city you're going to travel to, um, preparing to speak series. So you can have many, preparing to speak in class, preparing to speak at seminars, conferences, learning to do. How do you learn to make a pizza? How do you learn to make a poster? How do you learn to buy a computer? So all of these different things are examples of scenarios. Some of them are, could be at lower levels and some of them could be at higher levels. And I'll talk later about uh, who can develop a scenario or a scenario idea as well. Okay, so 
one of the, the core features of um, scenario-based assessments is the uh, a common understanding of what is meant by communicative language teaching. Now, this is uh, an, a term that's been used widely and worldwide textbooks are, have been produced calling the, the textbooks communicative language teaching. But often the focus is not on communication, either because textbook writers have not done a good job or because teachers themselves do not do a lot of communication. They resort to a lot of vocabulary and grammar and uh, and discourse markers and so on. Of course, those are important. No one's saying that vocabulary and grammar are not essential. They are linguistic resources that language learners have to use in order to, to be able to do certain tasks, right? But the focus of communicative language teaching has to be on communication. Scenario-based assessment is focused on communication. So that's why it's well aligned with the methodology of teaching uh, in any language. Although in many parts of the world, the term is used, but it's not widely practiced. Uh, the second feature is it's a natural context in an academic and professional setting. So, the, you know, a natural context in a classroom is if you're a teacher to promote language learning through communication. And uh, this, this can happen quite uh, naturally without uh, an artificial sort of uh, tweak to your curriculum or your teaching. Activities uh, are meaningful. So getting to know series is a kind of meaningful thing. It's high on authenticity because getting your visa, for example, or getting to know the program, getting to know your university is something that you would naturally do. So it's high on authenticity and it fosters good language learning practice. And the one more set of things is that it is typically uses integrative skills. Uh, because of, of the naturally occurring context <clears throat> and it promoting language learning in a natural way. Here are some examples. So if you have a listening task and you have some listening input that uh, test takers have to listen to, they could listen and they could use the listening for speaking. They could use the listening for writing or they could use the listening for speaking and writing. So this is one type of uh, scenario where you can integrate listening, speaking, and writing activities within one scenario. You can have a scenario-based uh, uh, reading task, which is reading followed by writing based on the reading, or reading followed by speaking based on the reading, or you can have all three skill areas uh, in the scenario. So you can have reading followed by speaking and followed by writing. So you could have kinds of combinations that are meaningful in your context. <clears throat> Here is the illustrative example I'm going to uh, present. This is a, a paper that has been published in Language Assessment Quarterly uh, with uh, uh, Coral uh, Chin, who's a PhD student at the University of Ottawa, and Cecilia Zhao, <clears throat> who's a professor at the University of Macau. So we wrote this paper together based on our experience of developing a scenario-based language assessment. Here is the abstract, which is in English as well as in Chinese, in Mandarin. So <clears throat> we want to we put the abstract out in two languages so that we can reach a wider audience. And it's also an audience that might be interested in uh, this approach because it's, uh, it was tried out in a university in Asia. And uh, you will have the slides so you don't have to make notes, but this is how it looks, the abstract. And this is the front page. I'm sorry, I don't have a better copy of this front page. This is the front page of the actual journal article in language assessment quarterly. You have the title and you have, sorry, you have the title and you have the abstracts. Okay, here is the first uh, scenario <clears throat> that I'm going to present from that paper. So this is called getting your visa. So this is the flow of the tasks. First, the test taker has to read information about visas, how to get a visa, what 
are the different kinds of visa possibilities. So this would be an independent reading task. You can have just reading followed by some questions if you're interested in finding out their independent reading level. Okay, so they read about the visa. And then the next step is they watch the a visa interview or visa video and take notes. So imagine that on the website, there's a visa officer who's talking to an applicant and saying, asking questions and the visa applicant is answering. So this is the video that they have to watch and they answer some questions. This could be considered independent listening. <clears throat> the third task in this sequence is read and fill out the visa form, which is a very natural task. And we like it for its authenticity. Uh, they have to fill out the form and the form has to be filled out based on some information that they have gained from the reading as well as the video. So we think this is an integrated task. It's listening, reading, and writing. Okay. And finally, they have to write a justification for, for the visa. So we say write justification for your visa. Uh, this is like 100 words or 200 words at the end of the application form where a test taker, in this case, or an applicant for a visa, in, in the real in a real life context has to write a paragraph on or so to say why a visa should be given to, to that person, why they should get a visa. So this is the flow, independent reading, independent listening, in the integrated listening, reading and writing, and then in, in, uh, independent writing. <clears throat> so here is an example. This is not exactly the the screenshot of the test, but this is what you have. You need a visa to enter Australia to attend, whether it's a college or a high school or a seminary. And on the right side, you have generally uh, a citizen of a foreign country should get a visa and you must have a student visa to study and so on. So they read information like this. After they read the information, they watch now, I, we don't have tasks at the end. You could have questions at, prior to getting to the listening. So you have the reading, you can have questions. We didn't choose to have questions, but if you're interested in independent reading, you can have the scenario there, you can have questions. For the first uh, task, that's the reading. You come to the listening, they watch the video. Here is a visa officer on the right, talking to a student on the left, exchanging documents. And there are some questions at the end of the video to establish independent uh, listening. And there's also a box on the right to, for note taking. <clears throat> After this comes the application form. We simulated an actual application form where they have to fill out, you know, an application uh, details, uh, you know, name, uh, gender, place of birth, telephone, uh, information of vis uh, visa or visit, um, documents, types of visa required and so on and so forth. So uh, this is a like an actual application form. And then the last task is the writing task where they have to write a justification. Okay, and then this is the end of scenario one. So <clears throat> just to go back and think about it a little bit, Instead of asking some random questions on some random passages on reading and listening and writing, what we've done is put these themes together. We said, what we want is getting your visa. Now, what can we do with getting your visa? What does a test taker typically have to do? Now, similar questions can be asked regarding getting to know your university. So test takers can be asked to do certain activities so that they have a better understanding of getting to know the new university they're going to, or getting to know your program, or getting to know your professors. So one of the tasks that many people like uh, in Australia is getting to know your professors, where <clears throat> test takers have to, I mean, a student typically would go to a website, uh, look up uh, the department, look up the professors who are teaching there, uh, read something about them, and and then they're asked to say which professor they would like to uh, take a particular course in. So, you know, this is a, a, a real um, activity that uh, students would in, in real life uh, do. And in a test context, 
they could find this relevant. <clears throat> okay. Now, in order to do this um, systematically and meaningfully, we did a number of things that you will see. One is we did a co-metrics analysis. Co-metrics is an automated software for linguistic analysis. So you can go to this website, co-metrics, uh, and then uh, put your paragraph, the paragraph you want them to read, or a text you want them to read, and then it will analyze the text for you and tell you how easy or difficult it is. So on the left, you see um, <clears throat> narrativity. In terms of narration, there's only 16% of narration. In terms of syntactic simplicity, it's 39%. In terms of word concreteness, it's 91%. And referential cohesion and deep cohesion a little less, 34 and 44. And overall, on the flesh Kincaid grade level, it's like an 11. So if you look at just the bars, you'll find the this paragraph that we had for the, it's an example that we had for getting to know your visa is relatively simple. It's not very difficult. Although there's less narration, more narration is simpler. There's less narration, but the word concreteness is extremely high, which means there are no abstract things or abstract thoughts or reflective thoughts that are much more difficult to, um, uh, you know, understand if you are, if you're not a, uh, you know, at, at the language uh, proficiency level that you need to be. <clears throat> so here's one analysis. Uh, this might look a little overwhelming. This is a table of specifications that we uh, used to track all the things we were doing. <clears throat> so let's look at the first uh, uh, part of the table of the top part, and that is for the scenario applying for a visa. And we classified it at an A2 level in the CEFR scheme of things. So it might be like a level three, level four uh, at the, in the China standards of English. We had three tasks, IND reading, IND listening. So that's both independent and then we had an integrated task that's INT, reading, listening, and writing. And then we have the task description, read a notice calling for a visa application, watch a video about a student applying for a visa, and based on the notice and the video, write a paragraph. And then we have the response format. We had the number of items. We had co-metrics analysis for the first reading part, the fresh Kincaid level. Uh, we also did a Lex Tutor level. The Lex Tutor is another um, uh, software that can be used. It's very good with vocabulary. We use that. We also did a conversation analysis in case there were conversations. We wanted to track the number of turns in the conversation and the speed at which people were talking. We think speed is a very important um, feature to track for uh, listening tests because uh, the fast, a uh, fast uh, uh, paced speech may be much more difficult uh, than a slower paced speech with the same context, with the same text. And we have in the last column, C of our level descriptors. So this is all for uh, task one, scenario one. We also did a second scenario, which was tourism. We went through the same, and then we, the same process. And then we did uh, a third scenario, changing McDonald's French fries recipe. Uh, <clears throat> with the same framework. Now, we developed about eight tasks, eight scenarios, um, eight sets of tasks, eight scenarios. I'm only presenting three here. And um, <clears throat> I want to comment on the scenarios themselves. Now, who chose the scenarios? We had a team of graduate students who were with us, with Cecilia and me, and we let the graduate students choose. We asked the graduate students to go out and meet the undergraduate students at the university. And we said, you find out what they're interested in. You find out what they're interested in, in, in terms of reading, listening, speaking, writing. What would they like to read? What would they like to listen to? And so the scenarios were chosen by the test takers. And we find there's a lot of value in that. We can ask students, what, what would you like to listen to or read about in English? Uh, so that we don't choose topics that are only interesting for us, you know, so who, who cares about us, right? I mean, as, <clears throat> uh, as uh, teachers, as professors, we might choose topics that are totally irrelevant and totally boring 
for test takers, and then it turns them off. They're not motivated. So one way of getting uh, um, useful topics for scenarios is asking test takers, asking your own students what they like to listen to or read. Okay, here's how we presented the score report. Now, at the end of the test, students received a score report, which was like this. So we gave information on scenarios. We identified whether they were independent or integrated. We had a bar going from zero to 10 or zero to 18 or zero to 32 for each of the task types. And we indicated that how much a particular student got uh, for each of the tasks, what they received in terms of a score. And you'll see that for some tasks that they were pretty good, like in scenario one, independent reading, 10 out of 10, but independent listening, only six out of nine and independent reading, listening, and writing, 10 out of 10. So they got, this test taker got 26 out of 29, and we show that in a pie chart at the end. So we did this for all tasks, and then we have an overall score of 85, and we categorize this um, test taker as belonging to a CEFR at the B2 level. And in addition to giving, them, giving all test takers a score report, we also gave them um, a score interpretation uh, card. We said your proficiency level is as follows. That's what we present on the left side. And then on the right side, we said, we've got to tell them how they can improve on the test because a test is just one measure, right? Do you, you, it, I think um, we need to, as uh, designers of a test, not only indicate the score, which is maybe a number, or a level like you're level five or you've got 100 points, but that's not very meaningful for test takers because they want more than that because they don't know what 100 or level five really means. So we've got to come up with descriptors. So here we have descriptors, gener generic descriptors for uh, a B2 level for 85 points. And then we also have, you can improve your skills by focusing on and we identify some of the things that this particular group of test takers, the, the people with the 85 points or the B2 points um, uh, are at. So we say these are the ways you can improve your capabilities or increase, increase your proficiency level. Now I want to say a few words about uh, other tests that are using scenarios. Uh, the Duolingo English test for university admission is using a, is going to use uh, interactive listening uh, with scenarios. Uh, so they've come up with some scenarios where you have professors talking to students, uh, students, for example, going and asking a professor for extension of the homework assignment. You know, the assignment is due on a Friday, but they would like to get an extension till Monday. So can they get the extension? So they have a conversation with the professor. So that's one type of scenario. Another type of scenario is two students talking to each other and saying, so what did the professor say about this topic? I didn't quite understand that. And they have a conversation to clarify some aspect of a lecture that the professor has given or some activity that the professor has conducted. And uh, then they, you, know, you can have a follow-up scenario where they go back to the professor and they tell the professor, professor, we've, uh, we think this is what you talked about and this is what, um, you wanted us to do for our next assignment, is this correct? And then the professor can respond. And uh, uh, so that, that is the um, essence of those scenarios in uh, the Duolingo, Duolingo English test uh, that's coming up in interactive listening. The occupational English test uh, used in Australia for health professionals, and it's uh, recognized in many, many parts of the world now. They use role plays for the speaking test or the listening speaking test. So the role plays work like this. Um, imagine you're a <clears throat> medical doctor, uh, you're a dentist, for example, and a patient, a young boy or a young girl comes into your office with the parent and says, I've got a toothache. I'm, you know, my tooth is hurting. And, and so the, the question is, how can a test taker, in this case, a dentist, a medical doctor, how should the medical doctor talk to this patient to find out how the problem can be solved? So the uh, 
medical doctor has, a, in terms of protocol, a certain set of questions to ask, also a certain set of uh, uh, statements regarding uh, care and uh, uh, calming the patient down, calming the, the parent, all of these uh, different aspects of sociolinguistics or pragmatics have to be mastered by the dentist. And so the dentist not only has to know his or her professional craft, but also has to be able to elicit uh, information from the patients so that uh, they can advise on uh, appropriate uh, direction of uh, medication or, or surgery or whatever it is. And, uh, and you know, fulfill his or her role as a caring professional. So um, the OET is a good example also of using scenarios. Now, there are some lingering questions that you may have, uh, and this is something to think about. How many scenarios do you need for a full test? Well, it depends on the purpose of the assessment and what kind of decision you're gonna make. Um, whether it's admission to courses, placement into courses, diagnostic feedback. As I said, uh, the, you know, it's uh, left to your design of the test. You don't have to have a whole test, which is scenario based. You could, I mean, we did that and the, the article we report on is a whole test, which is scenario based. But I would recommend at least one or two sections that are relevant in your context to be scenario based. Like maybe the listening and speaking section is perfect for uh, a scenario based assessment. Uh, in your context. So try out maybe two tasks that are two scenarios that are, you know, uh, in this format, and then have multiple tasks in each scenario, which uh, bring together multiple skills. And that should uh, be a good start uh, in your context. Now, how do you score these assessments? Do you want to score them holistically, or analytically, or in terms of task completion? Uh, is it in terms of length? Is it in terms of linguistic and logical problems? Well, there are all kinds of issues related to this. So to begin with, I would suggest that you do something simple. You don't uh, overwhelm yourself uh, with lots of complex ways of scoring. So I would suggest a holistic score, if you like, one score for writing, for example, there or one score for speaking. If you want to have analytic scores, you can, but uh, analytic scores means you're going to give many, many scores, three or four or five scores for one task, and they have to be based on some features that you're interested in. Like, for example, in speaking, you might be interested in fluency, you might be interested in accuracy, you might be interested in linguistic complexity, and you might be interested in task completion. Now you've got four categories. You've got to come up with uh, guidelines as to what would count as a low score or a mid score or a high score for each of those categories. Now, if your test is going to be used for diagnostic purposes, this would be perfect. An analytic score would be necessary to give more information. If, you, if you're not interested in so much detail, then you can have a holistic score and that would serve uh, the, your purpose. And then how do you assemble all the scores to give a proficiency profile? So this is a, a trick in itself. You've got to look at all the integrated tasks, all the independent tasks, combine the scores of all the tasks in each of the two categories, independent and integrative, and then come up with a way of adding them up, if you like. If, you know, many organizations may want independent listening, speaking, reading, writing scores. And this is the tradition we have had for the last 50 or 60 years. So when you take a language test, you you know, especially the international language test, you get all these listening score, speaking score, reading score, writing score. Although we know that nobody does listening by itself, right? I mean, you, you just can't do listening by itself without any action. The action you would take is speaking or writing. Similarly, we just don't read without any follow up, we read because we want to read and then tell someone about it or write about it. So uh, um, unfortunately, we are still stuck with listening, speaking, reading, writing scores, but many organizations are now trying integrated scores. And the CEFR in its new version in 2020 has, you know, 
promoted the idea of integrated scoring. So receptive score and a productive score, for example, and an interactive score. So they've come up and a mediation score. So at least we can have the first three, receptive, productive, and interactive. So receptive means uh, listening and reading. Productive refers to speaking and writing. And inter interactive refers to these combinations like the combinations I've been talking about. As I said earlier, how to develop a list of useful scenarios, get views from your test takers. It's very, very important that we bring test takers into test development. We are not the only people who know about meaningful topics for test takers. They can inform us as well. Okay, uh, I think that's about it. Um, let's see, here are the references to the two uh, papers I talked about. One is the paper that I worked with Coral and, uh, and Cecilia. And then the, the other two is uh, Jim Purpura's uh, presentation given at the Duolingo webinar series. Um, and he's also written extensively in, in public, in, you know, in books and journals about this. And I want to say thank you very much. And I'll be happy to uh, take part in any discussion that follows. And I didn't want to talk for too long. I may have already talked for quite a long time. Thank you very much. Wonderful. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Kunin. Uh, really fascinating and uh, excellent. I don't want to take any time here with more comments from myself. I want to get right to questions. And uh, April, I don't know if you have um, some questions already or if you want to invite those. Um, yes, thank you, Dr. Philbeck. And for the audience in the Zoom, you can yeah, put your questions in the chat box. And now maybe let me to report uh, the viewers from our live stream. And here uh, at this moment, uh, the viewers on WeChat live stream is up to uh, 5,669. And the viewers on TikTok live stream is up to and about 1,300. And thank you for watching. And here's, um, I see uh, most of the audience, yeah, quite a lot. They said today's session is very informative, but not easy to understand. So they need more time to learn again and again. And also we have some basic questions like about the application and about USC. So let me pick some, uh, maybe just a few, yeah, questions about today's topic. And one audience uh, says, um, uh, that what is difference between task-based approach and uh, SBA, uh, senior scenario-based assessment? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, task-based approaches are focused on replicating tasks by themselves uh, from the real world to a testing context. Here we're talking about a scenario which has multiple tasks. So it's not just a, a reading task or a listening task, which is replicated, but it's a whole set of tasks that are being used with a scenario as the, uh, what do you call it? The over, overarching uh, device. Thank you. And now I see uh, the check box. Uh, we've got uh, audience uh, CC. And uh, thank you, professors. Sometimes the language we use in the test, we seldom use them in the study or daily life. It's more like we learn the English to prepare to pass the exam or to get a certain score. So how can I have the English uh, be improved? Well, uh, I'm not an expert in language uh, learning. Uh, there are many people at USC who are, but uh, I can say having uh, learned English myself as a second language speaker of English, uh, there is no magic uh, bullet. Uh, as you know, learning a second language or a third language requires extensive work uh, in terms of listening, in terms of reading, in terms of writing. So. You, you have your classes, you take your classes, then you go further and you uh, learn from, you know, listening to uh, news or programs in English or movies in English. You read articles, stories, uh, books in English, and you learn to write uh, small things and then longer things and so on. 
So there's no magic, I think. I don't know. There are many organizations that will tell you there's a there's some magic formula or a magic bullet. But I think um, uh, it's like learning to play the piano. I mean, you know, you cannot learn to play the piano overnight. So it will take a long time, lots of practice. And I think language learning is similar. Thank you. Yes, it's like a skill for your whole life, like playing the piano. Thank right. you. And uh, another audience, uh, Amy Min. Um, uh, Dr. Kunan, you also wrote much about fairness and justice with regards to language assessments. So what your recommendation to make scenario assessment fair, just and incredible? Yes. So anytime you design a test, you have to be cognizant of these two topics fairness and justice is your is your test fair to all test takers this is a simple thing right and if it's not fair why would you have a test why would even test takers bother to take your test imagine if you designed the test and said well here's a test i'm not sure it's fair but if you want to take it you can take it now what would be the point of that right so a, a test has to be a device which is fair to everyone now, having said that it's not easy to to, uh, to do that because we have test takers who are young, who are middle-aged or older, we have gender, we have academic background, we have rural test takers, we have urban test takers, we have test takers from around the world if you are doing an international test, even if you're doing a test in your own college or university, there are students from different backgrounds you have to consider and their background knowledge. So if you ask them to write an essay on a topic that they know nothing about, so then that, that task would be unfair. So yes, we have to be always vigilant about fairness uh, of tests. We also have to be vigilant about justice. We, we should see that no harm is done to people, that the test is not um, discriminating against any group of people. So we have to be vigilant about that. So no matter what test you design, whether you design an old-fashioned test or a scenario-based test, yes, you have to be always vigilant about fairness and justice, and I'm happy to answer any more questions about that, uh, you know, directly, if you want to send uh, your questions to me. Thank you, Dr. Kuna. Um, let me check the audience uh, questions. Um, another one is um, about, uh, you just mentioned score assessment. There are many type, like uh, holistic, feature-based, and text-based. So which one? Uh, to choose to use in the real practice, uh, like for example, maybe in a bilingual test or other kind of uh, test? So typically my advice, I mean, this is a very good question and a very uh, complex question if you take it uh, you know, into a lot of depth. But basically you would use a holistic measure for writing and speaking. That is one score, one score for writing and speaking tasks. If you are interested in giving that information to the test taker and the test taker knows what that interpretation is, what that number or category is, like if you say you're a B2 or you're level six or you're, you've got 10 out of 20, they know what that means and they can go away and do something. I don't know what they would do. Maybe get admission to a university or not get admission. So a holistic score does that. It's easier to do. For the rater, for the teacher, easier, you know, and easier to interpret. Now, an analytic score, as I mentioned, has two, three, four, five subcategories under, say, speaking. So, as I said, if you want to assess fluency, which is a very important aspect of speaking, if you want to assess accuracy, and that is not making too many errors in your speech is in, and complexity of language like are you using very simple sentences all the time or are you able to mix sentences together uh, and words together so it shows your command of uh, grammar and vocabulary and your topic relevance are you talking about the topic when the, the, the topic may be tell me how you like your particular city and if the person is not talking about that then you know you would get the person would get low points on that. So you, you have these four categories. Now you've got to come up with the number of points for each of these categories. Are you going to give the same number of points, 10 points maximum for each of them? Or are they going to be weighted in some way? 
one or two categories would get higher points, one or two categories would get lower points. Having decided that, then you can use this information to give to students, to the test taker. And you can say, look, you did very well on your speaking task. You got like a B2 or a C1 or level seven or level eight on the Chinese, the China standards of English. And you were good on these features, on fluency, on accuracy, but you are not so good on complexity. So what happens here is the test taker gets more information. And if you combine the inter score interpretation with how they can do better, okay, you've told them that their vocabulary is not that great or grammar is not that great. So what should they do? So if you're like a teacher would help them, the testing institution should also help them by saying, hey, you've done this, you've got so far, but now you need to do these other things in order to move up your, your proficiency level to a higher level. So the choice of what type of scoring to use is something that you as a test designer should uh, uh, think about. Uh, is it for uh, placement uh, or is it for diagnosis? These are two extremes. So diagnosis would need more information, placement, least information. Okay, thank you. This is a big question. I also agree, yes. And yeah, since our live streaming now in total is around 8,000 viewers, and I would like to bring one more question about uh, today's session. And uh, this audience uh, asked what kind of questions to, keep, to give test takers uh, to be better fit them uh, when designing the test. Yeah, so what uh, scenarios to use so that the scenarios better fit the test takers? I gave you one idea, and I think it's a very powerful idea. Ask the students uh, in your current class what topics they would like, what scenarios they would like. I gave a talk many months ago, almost a year ago. I gave two talks for teachers in Australia. And I found this was one of the most exciting things that they took away from my talk. They said it helped them a lot, that, that we could ask students to tell us uh, about uh, possible topics. They had never considered that. They, you know, we think we know what they should know, right? And uh, we often uh, give them very boring things to read or, or take part in. And so the uh, motivation may be low. They may go through the task uh, sort of without really enjoying it. But in the case of say foreign students going to Australia, they felt that getting to getting your visa, that's uh, in home, in, in your own country, but getting to know your professors, getting to know your program, getting to know your city can be done after they arrive. So imagine students from China going to Australia and in, in they're in Australia now, in Melbourne, at the University of Melbourne, and the scenarios are getting to know your city, the city of Melbourne or your neighborhood, getting to know your professors and your program. Now, these are natural tasks. These are authentic. These are meaningful. These are things that they would like to do themselves anyway. So in the, whatever it's called, the ELI, or the English Language Institute or ESL program, could have topics in their, in their program like, the, like these. And I think uh, they'll be more meaningful than asking them to read about three kinds of rocks or whatever, you know, typical tasks are. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kunan. And since about the time and time flies and it's close to the end uh, to our today's session and as tradition for our event, and we would like to invite our speakers to give some words and Dr. Fieldback and also Dr. Kunan and to our audience, they are uh, some of them students, language learners or teachers, and maybe others are parents. So uh, to them, we want you to give them some words and advice. Well, <clears throat> wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, let me just, before we let uh, Dr. Kunan give final words, I would love to just First of all, thank you on behalf of the TESOL program. Uh, thank you for your hosting, April, and moderating so well. And Dr. Kunin, thank you for your talk. Clearly uh, a lot there, and we'll have to watch the recording again. And as was commented on, 
you know, there's a lot to think through, but that's good. You've given us a lot to chew on. And I just want to say, I love your emphasis on going to the students for their input. Uh, that's that's amazing. And I, I really love that and would encourage all the listeners to really think about that, what that might mean for their own teaching. And also, I just want to encourage everyone, you know, you may have heard some things that tonight that are inspiring. I mean, you may be teaching in a high stakes test environment where you got to teach to the test, or maybe you don't feel like you have the resources to build a test, you know, like the resources that Duolingo might have. But I hope you heard in Dr. Kunin's talk, take some small steps, try some of this out. Think of a scenario that you can include, uh, can, uh, include in your assessment to augment your teaching next week or tomorrow. Um, I was really inspired by this and I hope others were as well. So um, thank you uh, so much. And thank you to all of you that are, that are uh, viewing tonight. Uh, thank you, Rob. In my final uh, comments, I want to say, Thank you all. Of, thanks to all of you for attending this uh, uh, seminar. I'm happy to um, uh, to present and discuss these matters, and I'd be happy to continue the discussion if you choose to. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't want you to feel uh, uh, overwhelmed by the all the different aspects of the task uh, that on hand on the scenario based assessment, but as Rob said. Choose one scenario that you think will work with your students. Try it out next week or the week after. See, have multiple tasks. Ask them after they finish the tasks, after they finish the multiple tasks, whether they like this way of organizing a test. So that would be the best way for you to understand the strengths and weaknesses of this test. And maybe a group of you can do a little research project on it for your USC work or, or even for publication, because the, the best way to understand uh, uh, an innovative idea like this is to try it out. And if you may be successful in, in small uh, ways uh, to, uh, next week, but as you get more comfortable with many of the features, you might get better. So uh, uh, don't give up hope, enjoy uh, uh, the program and uh, think about scenarios that you might want to use. So I wanna thank all of you for taking the time to uh, listen to me today. And thanks to USC as well. Thank you, Dr. Philbeck and Dr. Kunan. And Dr. Kunan, if you don't mind, I just spot one question is for you in the Zoom chat box for a quick answer maybe. Um, it's from audience Lee. Dr. Kunan, there must have been extensive researches concerning what makes the questions uh, indicative about uh, the student's ability level, but what makes a test authoritative to universities? That's a, thanks for the question. It's a very complex question. Um, how universities consider a particular test authoritative is uh, universities will typically have a panel of uh, teachers or professors who examine international tests for use in their own university. And they would probably call the institution, uh, the testing institution, or look up their website these days and get facts and figures about the test. And then look at the research that's been published about the test, especially in terms of validation and fairness to see if the test is valid for the purpose that they want to use, uh, whether the test is fair. And then the committee would make a judgment on uh, whether the, that particular test could be used in their university or in their program. Sometimes programs, I mean, the university programs may be specific when compared to a university. Universities may have different levels of requirement. A particular program that has uh, a lot of reading, you know, like a literature program, may require a higher uh, level of proficiency and so forth. So it's quite a complex uh, task. And uh, Rob says um, he has served on a similar committee. And uh, yeah, the process, I think, is, is similar, I suppose. Yeah, there you go. And I don't know if you want to add to that, Rob. No, I don't. I, I don't. But you you really laid it out. I mean, it, it is bringing together uh, a group of faculty and uh, you know, pouring over the, the 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 exam itself and what's being proposed, but also comparing that to the literature and ultimately making a, a decision as to whether it is a, uh, as you said, uh, and the question uh, authoritative and a credible and something that we want to offer. So, um, 
just sharing, corroborating that based on my experience. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, it's the end of our session and for the masterclass, and maybe we will have the next one in the future. So stay tuned with us uh, and study with us.